Hello, my name is Judy Hoffman, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Evanston and a resident of the 16th District. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening on behalf of the League and our co-sponsor, the Skokie Public Library. The forum we are presenting this evening is for the primary election Democratic race for the state representative for the 16th Legislative District, and the forum will run one hour. A little bit of housekeeping, you've heard this before. Make sure that your electronic devices are silenced and no flash photography. Also, uh, photos are fine, but this forum, you cannot do any video or audio recording of the forum. We are filming it in its entirety and it'll be on YouTube and on the League website in a day or two. And the League's website's address is on your program that hopefully you got when you came in the door, lwve.org. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. The League works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, observes governing bodies, and provides information for voters at election time. The League does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. This year, 2022, the League of Women Voters of Evanston is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the League was founded just two years after the 19th Amendment was passed for women to get the right to vote. If you'd like to find out more about the League, visit our table in the lobby. On the behalf of the League, I'd like to express our thanks to the administration of the Skokie Public Library for the contribution of the, of the auditorium this evening and the support for tonight's forum. I'd also like to thank our student volunteers from Niles North High School and Evanston Township High School. I know we are all grateful to see our students active in the democratic process and your assistance is invaluable, thank you. If you need an index card, you know to raise your hand. One of our, one of our volunteers will send you a card and a pen if needed. When it's ready, raise your hand again, pass it down the row, and uh, we will then um, work that through the process. Our moderator will explain further about the processing of the questions. Uh, one item is your question must be directed to all candidates, not an individual. Primary election day is June 28th, and early voting begins at selected locations on June 1st. We're lucky to live in a county and a state that provides so many options for registration and for voting. And for more information on key registration and voting dates, early voting locations, sample ballots, and more, visit the websites of suburban Cook County and City of Chicago election authorities, and the key dates and those web addresses are on the back side of your program flyer. And after the forum, you'll be able to meet with the candidates and their uh, staff in the auditorium lobby. Now on to the forum. <laughs> For all league forums, we engage a moderator that resides from outside the district of the race. And today we're honored to have Lolly Watt from the Wilmot League, soon to be the Chicago League. <laughs> and lolly has been involved with her local, county, and state league leagues for almost 20 years. And currently she is serving on the League of Women Voters National Board. She's been on for two years. So Lolly, we thank you for your dedication and your leadership. And I hand it over to you. Thank you all for being here this evening, and thank you to our candidates. This is really where democracy happens. You know, we need voters, we need candidates, and nothing would happen without both groups. So thank you for being here. I would like to start this evening, though, with just a thought from all of us going out to Texas, where um, 14 children and one of their teachers lost their lives today. You can see that. Hard for me, I think it's hard for all of us. So um, let's keep that in mind as we go through this forum and uh, try to honor what happened today. So with that, 
Uh, the candidates have both agreed to a format for this uh, forum this evening, which is that we will start with opening statements from each of them. We did a coin toss, and candidate uh, Olikow won that coin toss and chose to go first with the opening statement. Each of them will have one and a half minutes for that. Then we're going to go through and ask questions of each of them. Uh, both of them will answer each question. So again, please make sure your questions are phrased in a way that it applies to both equally. And then at the end, we're gonna have closing statements in the reverse order from the opening statements. So uh, candidate Stoneback will go first in the closing statement. We have two timers in the front. If you would hold up your paddles, because we have one and a half minutes per question, they are going to help our candidates and me out by giving them a 30 second warning and then a 15 second warning and then a stop. Um, I have told the candidates they by no means have to use all the time allocated to them because we'd like to get through as many questions as we can. So we will try to keep it moving. Uh, they have the opportunity for two rebuttals during this process. They understand how that works. They can only rebut twice, and there is no rebuttal to a rebuttal. Let me see. Um, again, please try to be really respectful of the time and this forum. Please don't clap, cheer, jeer, uh, do any of that stuff. Let's give maximum time to our candidates so we can hear from them so you can make informed decisions. With that, and with thanks, oh, I, I should tell you about how the questions are being processed. As you pass these questions out to the volunteers, they're being taken to the back of the screen here. We have three question sorters there who are looking at them just to see if there's any way we can combine them. So if three of you have asked the same thing, we're not gonna ask that three times. Um, and making sure that they're appropriate for both candidates. Other than that, you know, we, we are happy to ask all questions. We are just trying to keep this moving and not duplicate questions. Uh, so with that, timers, we are going to start. I have 6.45 and we're gonna go for uh, close to an hour, taking out some time for this beginning portion. So, candidate Olakal, your opening statement, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Olicle, and I'm running to represent the 16th District in the Illinois Legislature. I was born and raised in the 16th, and this community has shaped me into the person that I am today. My family is the beneficiary of public sector union jobs, well-funded public schools, affordable and accessible housing, and other policies that have put working families first. These opportunities are a result of, direct result of good governance. However, I'm aware that not every family within my district and across our state have these same opportunities due to systemic barriers. The COVID-19 pandemic shed light on these immense systemic issues, and I saw firsthand how easily families and individuals fell through the cracks. During the height of the pandemic, I was working directly with small businesses, nonprofits, and seniors, and I heard from them how deeply they were being impacted by these failures. My campaign has and always will be driven by fiercely progressive principles. I'm committed to advancing and protecting policies for working and immigrant families across the 16th district, I've knocked on thousands of doors and spoken to countless constituents in our district who feel unheard, forgotten, and left out of their government. I'm committed to bringing their voices with me to Springfield so that we can build a government that prioritizes children, public schools, providing economic opportunity for all, health care that is focused on providing care and not profit. And these problems we face are immense and require comprehensive, inclusive solutions. In order to get these things done, we need ethical, effective leadership, and I'm committed to bringing that to the residents of the 16th. Thank you. And now candidate Stoneback. Thank you. First, many thanks to the League of Women Voters, the Skokie Public Library, and everyone here. I've actually spent many hours in this library. I grew up right here in Skokie, where I attended public schools, graduated from Niles North, and raised my own family. As a former teacher who later worked in educational publishing, I'm a strong proponent of education. After the Sandy Hook school shooting, I founded a nonprofit to fight gun violence, which I led for six years. I helped pass landmark legislation and was instrumental in stopping the largest firearms facility of the Midwest from opening near Niles West. As your elected state rep, 
I'm very proud of my accomplishments and the collective work we've done in the legislature. Illinois' fiscal situation has dramatically improved. I've been advocating for rewarding work, not wealth, and we've closed corporate loopholes, passed balance budgets, and a $1.8 billion package of tax relief to ease inflation. In my first year as legislator, I passed a major bill to prevent domestic violence, shootings, mass shootings, and gun suicides. I passed more bills to help domestic violence victims, keep people in stable housing, and a youth mental health bill. I'm the first woman to represent our district, and I've strongly supported women's rights, voting to repeal the last anti-abortion law in Illinois, codify Roe, and fund Planned Parenthood. I introduced a bill to fight sexual assault and harassment in the workplace by banning NDAs in these cases. With Roe at stake, it is more important than ever to protect women's rights and the rights of the LGBT community, and also prevent mass shootings like the one that we just heard about today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opening statements. We are now going to go into the question and answer portion. The first three questions are from the League of Women Voters, and then we will move to audience questions. The first question, starting with candidate Olikow, what are your budget priorities for Illinois? What are the most important challenges facing our state? I think, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think one of, one of the top priorities when it comes to budget allocation is related to public schools. I think in Illinois, we're overly reliant on using property taxes to pay for our schools, and it creates an inequity and opportunity depending on where you live. So we need to make sure the state's fulfilling its obligation to fully fund our public schools. Uh, this also includes higher education institutions. Uh, we need to make sure our public universities are affordable and accessible to our residents. Um, in addition to that, uh, we need to make sure that we're properly allocating funds to expand health care to all. And uh, another priority is also uh, now that with everything that we're seeing nationally uh, with the attack on Roe v. Wade, we need to make sure that Illinois is doing its part to continue to be a safe, a safe haven for reproductive rights and start prioritizing some of our funding to support the women in surrounding states who are going to see their rights taken away, uh, who are going to need to come to Illinois for reproductive health care. Uh, so those are some of the priorities that uh, I would focus on in the legislature. Thank you. Candidate Stonebeck, same question. Yes, thank you for that question. That's a very important question, and I agree that public education is certainly a top priority for Illinois. Um, public education has been underfunded for decades, and Illinois, per our Constitution, we should be funding public education from the state, and this is causing a rise in property tax taxes. I'm happy to say that um, in the past two years that I've been in office, we have funded public education at $350 million more than what is expected, and we, I plan to continue pushing for this trend. So it is definitely going to alleviate uh, the, the pressure on local school districts, um, which are taxing bodies, and lower property taxes. Uh, this is a, a really long plan. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, but we will see a trend in this direction. So I'm happy to say that we we actually funded this past fiscal year uh, public education at $12 billion, which was robust, um, and also a lot in higher education. Um, and other priorities also definitely include public safety. We funded public safety at $450 million in fiscal year 23, uh, including resources for community violence prevention organizations and uh, resources for law enforcement as well. And one last thing I'd like to say is we really need to look at our workforce in Illinois. We have uh, a shortage of teachers, doctors, and nurses, and other healthcare professionals. We need to invest in job opportunities and job training for the workforce that we need to develop for tomorrow. For this next question, we're going to start with candidate Stonebeck. Do you think the state is doing enough to increase access to effective mental health care? What, if anything, would you do differently? Yes, thank you for that question. Mental health care is certainly a priority for me. I actually sit on the Mental Health Care and Addiction Committee in the Illinois Legislature and am very extremely troubled by the decline in mental health in our communities, especially during the pandemic. At one point in the pandemic, approximately one third of youth between 14 and 21 had suicidal thoughts or ideation. And in response, uh, I introduced several mental health bills I think that um, we need to expand access to mental health for everyone. This is a critical part of our healthcare system. We need to erase stigma. I'm happy to say that one of my bills for accessing youth mental health uh, did pass 
and is on its way to the governor's office. It will uh, make sure that all youth uh, study as part of the health education uh, how and where to access mental health in Illinois. Thank you. Candidate Olicall. Yes, I echo uh, Representative Stoneback's uh, commitment to expanding and protecting funding for mental health care. Uh, yes, we have to make sure that we're erasing the stigma around mental health care, especially coming out of a pandemic where we saw so much pressure be put on, on, on kids, on, on people uh, who, who are uh, you know, dealing with something that we've never seen before. Uh, we need to make sure that our schools have, every school has social workers in place to make sure that kids at a young age are able to get the mental health care that they need. Uh, because it starts at, we need to make sure that we're, we're dealing with these problems uh, at, the, at the very beginning and make sure that um, regardless of where that school is, uh, a, a child's going to be able to have a social worker in there. Uh, another thing that we need to uh, focus on is um, uh, one thing that uh, we have to think about is uh, expanding mental, uh, one, I apologize. Um, one thing that is important to me is making sure that we are also seeing that people who are within the criminal justice system, dealing with the criminal justice system, are able to access mental health care as well. Uh, I got a chance to sit on a task force uh, in 2017 where we worked with uh, stakeholders to find ways to make sure that kids that are being put into the juvenile justice system that need mental health resources and health care are being diverted to those resources instead of being put into the carceral system. So uh, that's something that I would like to focus on in the legislature as well. You. We will start with you again, candidate Olakal, on this next question. Um, innumerable businesses are struggling with large-scale staffing shortages. What do you believe are the two or three most in impactful things that the state can do to increase the labor supply? I think the state has to continue to protect and expand worker protections. I think COVID exacerbated uh, what we knew was that workers have been, their rights have been chipped away at for, for decades without the ability to organize and, and bargain for, for protections and higher wages. Uh, and so the, the, the state needs to incentivize growing our, our workforce development programs, uh, make sure that we are uh, increasing protections for people that want to, we're, we're seeing that so many people were burnt out of specific fields like teaching and healthcare, and we didn't make sure that we're listening to those frontline workers and those teachers and making sure that the profession is safe and uh, we're able to bring people back in, into those, uh, into those uh, professions. Uh, I saw how, how difficult it was for small businesses to weather COVID. I worked directly with small businesses and nonprofits that were uh, trying to navigate COVID recovery efforts during the height of the pandemic. And unfortunately, a lot of the federal programs that existed uh, left small businesses out in the cold. Uh, if they didn't have if they were 1099 employees, if they were mom and pop shops, they were barber shops, uh, they didn't qualify for a lot of funds. So we need to make sure we're thinking about long-term COVID recovery as well, uh, making sure the state's allocating funds to uh, rebuild the small business uh, environment in Illinois, uh, because oftentimes we find the state's willing to dole out funds for big corporations. We need to do the same to support small businesses and minority-owned businesses as well. Thank you. Candidate Stonebeck? Yes, could you repeat the question again, please? Sure. Um, Innumerable, innumerable businesses in Illinois are struggling with large-scale staffing shortages. What do you believe are the two or three most impactful things the state can do to increase the supply of labor? Thank you. Um, I would say that in Illinois, we have a shortage of many different professions. We really need to look at which professions uh, are struggling and how to help those businesses uh, I really think that we need to invest in job training and vocational training and funnel people into um, these programs in order to expand job opportunities, incentivize people, um, definitely give them better benefits. We need to, I was very happy to pass um, the constitutional amendment uh, codifying really uh, labor protections last year. Um, people need to be able to be reassured that if they are working, they are benefiting from it and they are not being taken advantage of when they are going to a job and really lift up small businesses in our community. And I was happy last year uh, to go door to door to small businesses in our community and let them know about different programs that the state had, for example, back to business uh, program that we had in the state to help lift up these, back to, uh, these businesses and help them take advantage and many, many businesses in our district in our community took advantage of these grants from the state 
and, um, and, and really it helped get them through the hard times. But long term, definitely job opportunities, vocational training, and incentivizing business. Thank you. Um, we will stay with you for the next question. With the mass shooting in Texas today, what are your plans to strengthen gun laws in Illinois? Thank you. I, I, I just have to say that I am absolutely devastated as a, as a person, as a, as a mother, as a human being, as a member of society. Um, when I heard the news earlier today, I could barely believe it. And because after the Sandy Hook school shooting, it affected me so much. Um, I was working on second grade textbooks uh, for little children uh, in my job as an educational publisher. And I just thought, what's the use of doing these textbooks when second graders are getting shot in their classroom to pieces? And today, um, I am, with all the more resolve, determined to pass the strongest gun safety laws possible to prevent a shooting like what we just are hearing of details of today. Um, that is just, just makes me uh, all the more passionate to work. Um, my ideas for gun safety, actually I have five bills active in the, in the legislature right now. I was able to pass a major gun safety bill last year to strengthen our red flag law. Um, to prevent mass shootings, like what just happened today. And unfortunately, in, in 90 seconds, I am not going to be able to, to give you a rundown of everything that I have planned for gun safety, but hopefully uh, we will address it again. Okay, candidate Olikal. I echo what Representative Stonebeck shared. Uh, it's horrific to see these incidents. Uh, it just, it seems like we're hearing about this over and over again. Um, and w we have to do more. And gun violence prevention, uh, part of it is personal for my family uh, because un 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 unfortunately gun violence has been an issue that we've been dealing with for decades and generations. Uh, my family moved to Skokie because their house was shot up in a drive-by twice. And my father was injured in one of those incidents. Um, every day families are being ruined by gun violence and as a state representative we have to support comprehensive solutions to gun violence. I would, I understand that change is incremental um, and no one gun law is going to save every life, but we owe it to our children, families, communities across Illinois to save as many lives as possible. Uh, I look forward to supporting bills uh, that allocate fund for the enforcement of current gun laws, including universal background checks systems and private transfer background check like that found in HB 562, supporting legislation that would limit magazine sign size for ammunition in Illinois and ban magazines with more than 10 rounds, we need to work with gun violence survivors, community organizations, and law enforcement to find and fund community intervention programs, as well as programs uh, that help survivors of gun violence. Um, it all boils down to being an effective advocate, and we need to make sure that we're championing legislation that uh, includes all stakeholders and are truly comprehensive and, and addressing these issues at, at the root cause. Thank you. Um, we will start with you, candidate Olikal, on the next one. Would you support in, uh, incentives to communities willing to revise zoning policies to encourage more affordable housing? Sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Would you support incentives to communities willing to revise zoning policies to encourage more affordable housing? Absolutely. Uh, I think we need to do a lot more to incentivize uh, affordable housing. Uh, part of that is, is a zoning. If the state can incentivize communities to change zoning rules to uh, give more opportunity for multi, for, 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 house, for more affordable units. Uh, one thing that I would like to see the state do is incentivize communities to uh, in, ensure that developments are, uh, are, a lot, are, um, are including uh, community benefit agreements that uh, communities, so there's community input and there's a greater share of uh, affordable housing being implemented with, with different types of developments. Uh, we need to expand housing. Uh, uh, we need to make sure that there's greater protections in place for people who do seek public housing. Uh, unfortunately, they get taken advantage of, they get evicted, and there aren't enough resources for them to fight these evictions and fight these landlords. Uh, so we need to make sure we're expanding protections for people who are in uh, currently using public housing and, and are going to be using uh, uh, housing services. So um, part of that, yes, I would agree with uh, uh, changing, uh, incentivizing changing and zoning laws as well. Thank you, candidate Stonebeck. 
Yes, I would certainly uh, be in support of incentive, incentives to communities to change their zoning policies for uh, allowing affordable housing. Um, safe, affordable housing leads to greater socioeconomic stability and more opportunities for working families. Uh, housing really is a human right, and long before I was elected, I partnered with Open Communities Fair Housing Agency uh, to draft the principles of a welcoming community and plan for the 50th commemoration of Dr. Martin Luther King's speech on the Winneka Villa Gr Village Green in support of fair housing. Um, now in the legislature, I'm actually very, so interested in this, I requested and was appointed to the Housing Committee. Um, I actually passed a bill last year uh, unanimously to keep people at risk of homelessness uh, in stable housing by improving the criteria in the rental housing support program that's run by IDA. Um, we also passed HB 4784 to redevelop vacant and abandoned properties as affordable housing in communities of concentrated poverty. Um, I spearheaded conversations in the legislature around bringing temporary emergency transitional shelter to Illinois for homeless people uh, to have a place to stay with dignity, um, similar to what's been done in at least a dozen other states. And we, I was very happy to get uh, $150 million in affordable housing funding in fiscal year 23's budget. Um, more funding is definitely needed, and we can certainly put some of that funding towards incentives uh, for for localities. Thank you. Thank you. Starting with you, Candidate Stonebeck, on this next one, please share with us your views on how you will protect reproductive rights in Illinois. What is your record on this? So my record shows that I have advocated for women's health care and reproductive rights by, first of all, I was very happy to help repeal the last anti-abortion law in Illinois, the parental notice of abortion. Um, I'm not... Uh, even entirely certain that this uh, bill would have had my predecessor been in office been called. Um, I co-sponsored a resolution affirming the Supreme Court's decision in Roe and Griswold versus uh, Connecticut, and I supported funding for Planned Parenthood, declaring a commitment to access to quality health care, including reproductive rights. Um, I co-sponsored a bill to protect the licenses of medical professionals who face disciplinary action in other states because they provide abortion care. I will continue at every turn to stand up for women and women's rights, including, of course, reproductive rights. Um, there is certainly a possibility of a constitutional amendment uh, in light of the Roe decision or pending decision that we all fear uh, that would um, change the Illinois Constitution and we would need a referendum on the ballot. But the deadline to do this in 2022 has unfortunately passed, so we would need to wait for the next election, and I certainly would support this. Um, right now, I would like to say that uh, because of the Reproductive Health Act, re reproductive rights are safe in Illinois, but we will likely become even more of a safe haven than we have been for women's health care. We need to ensure that our medical providers and people who come here from other states are protected legally. Um, there is legislation in Connecticut, and we are looking at that. Um, I did speak with the head of Planned Parenthood about it, and we're seeing what we can introduce in Illinois. Thank you. Candidate Uh You know, it's really, I think the, the, the attack that we're seeing on Roe v. Wade shows why it's so important to have strong, effective state leadership. And luckily, uh, Roe v. Wade is codified into law here in Illinois, and I will support all, lef all efforts to keep it that way. 100% uh, pro-choice and want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to combat any sort of attack on that right here. Uh, we also need to uh, make sure that the state's doing its part to fully fund uh, or allocate more funding to organizations like Planned Parenthood uh, because we are unfortunately surrounded by states that don't have Roe v. Wade codified into law and have Republican right-wing extremist legislatures that are already stripping away these freedoms from women, and we need to make sure they can come to Illinois. So I will support all funding efforts to make sure that uh, Illinois is able to take in these women who are going to be coming here for reproductive health care. Um, and, uh, and, and if there's anything else, or if there's something that we can specifically do also to make sure that localities in, in different parts of the states are not enforcing these protections, uh, I would like to make sure that the state is coming in to make sure that uh, the, these, these localities or local governments in more conservative parts of the states are complying with the state's regulations and rules around uh, reproductive health care. Thank you. Candidate Olakal, starting with you. What are your opinions on the campaign for electoral reform in Skokie? 
Do you support these ballot initiatives? Why or why not? I think uh, it's really exciting to see uh, more people engaged at the local level. I think this is sort of a uh, a lot of people who who got really involved in politics in 2020 uh, is starting to realize how important it is to also pay attention to the local things happening at the local level. Uh, I haven't looked into the. I have not made a. I have not uh, taken a stance on the issue. I'm focusing on the race for state representative, but I'm really excited to see how I can uh, f find ways to support them uh, after this election. Thank you, candidate Stonebeck. Thank you for that question. I think this is uh, a really important issue for our community, and uh, I, I am also delighted to see so many people actively engaged and asking for signatures and talking about elections reform. Um, I actually uh, am on an elections working group in the Women's Caucus in the Illinois Legislature, and um, I have, while I have not specifically looked into or signed on to any local uh, referendum question uh, in the Illinois Legislature and generally, I will say that I am for any policy in elections that will make it more open and transparent and accessible to candidates to run, and my understanding is that some of those policies are in what is being put forward in the, in the Forum for Electoral Reform, so I certainly would support anything that makes it easier for candidates to run for office and represent their people, the people of the community. And certainly, um, I'm definitely in favor of having people be able to access their elected officials um, easily and readily. And I think that's something that we can all work on. I certainly try to be as accessible as possible and uh, responsive as possible. And I, and I think that would be great if we can uh, push that forward on the local level as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, candidate Stonebeck, starting with you. Illinois has 6,693 units of local government, far more than any other state. Should we consolidate units within each county to achieve budget savings? That's a very good question. Yes, we have many different units of local government, and we certainly want cost savings um, because all of us in government are always looking for ways to cut corners and, and, and trim budgets. However, I think that that needs to be determined. Um, in the Illinois legislature, we did put forward a bill um, that will look into whether or not units of local government, um, how much it will do a study and will collect the data and look at it. And, um, and, and I think that we really need that information in order to see whether or not uh, we need to condense units of local government. And I think also, um, that really it needs to be up to the community to some extent because in certain areas um, uh, there are local units of government that serve really important purposes where in other areas it might be duplicative. And so I think that it's, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution to this question. It needs to be looked at a little bit on an individual basis and I'm looking forward to getting the data from the, from the study that's going to be done um, uh, because of the bill that we passed. Thank you. Candidate Olikol. The municipal government consolidation sort of movement has been popular for a while, and I first learned about it when I got to be, I was a district director for a state representative, and I had to spend a lot of time working with a lot of local electeds, and I got a chance to sit down with a township supervisor, and he had explained that, uh, you know, these, these local bodies, uh, if you actually consolidate them, you might actually be increasing the cost, because uh, when you consolidate certain bodies, uh, of government, you actually force other uh, communities to have to raise the level of resources to match the this other community that may not have the same number of people, and it, it's a much more complicated process and can, in some in some instances, raise costs. Uh, you'll lose services that have to be picked up by other bodies of government, and so uh, these the it is not a blanket solution for every community, and uh, you. Each community has to decide for themselves, and they have to take. They have to do those studies. They have to figure out and make sure that the services that are going to be lost in a consolidation are going to be able to be picked up somewhere else. They're going to have to do. Uh, uh, they're going to have to do studies about if if this is actually going to be cost effective, and that decision should be left up to uh, those municipalities. And uh, those communities should come together and decide and vote for themselves whether or not they want to uh, consolidate those bodies of government. Okay, Stand, starting with you, candidate Olakal. Lead service lines are an issue in this district. What will you do to advance lead service line replacement? So I think we, uh, lead service line replacement is a, is a very important issue. Unfortunately, the, 
the communities that are often uh, of the struggle or dealing with the issues of lead uh, um, lead pipes are poor and minority communities uh, that have haven't seen the resources go towards infrastructure and so we need to make sure that as as the state decides to invest in infrastructure we are prioritizing those communities that are going to be most susceptible to having lead pipes uh, in their in their homes and in their in, in their um, in their water system and so I would support efforts to uh, make sure that we secure funding for to, to 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 combat the problem, but make sure that we're also doing it in an equitable way, and that the communities most affected are going to be the ones that are 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 seeing those uh, lead line replacements happen first. And also, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that protects the workers that are going to be involved in those replacements as well. And and I would work with uh, labor unions and and pipe trades to make sure that uh, we we collaborate on that legislation so so that uh, we can make sure that we're fixing the problem, but also not causing more problems. Thank you, candidate Stonebeck. Thank you very much. This is actually an issue that I uh, is is quite near and dear to my heart. Um, I actually introduced a bill, um, a trailer bill to the Lead Service Line Replacement and Notification Act, um, which would uh, break down barriers for the replacement of lead service lines uh, in uh, across our state. And what it was happening with the Lead Service Line and Replacement and Notification Act, it's requiring the changing of lead service lines, but in, per the Illinois uh, Plumbing Code, once you touch uh, one of those lead service lines, you have to separate the service, the water service, from the uh, sewer service by 10 feet. And this code in the Illinois Plumbing Code um, was really creating barriers. And so uh, my staff and I sat down with the Illinois Department of Public Health and other experts um, and talked with stakeholders and crafted a bill that would waive the requirement under certain circumstances um, that were agreeable to stakeholders and IDPH. And in the end, IDPH crafted a waiver, a statewide waiver that is now under implementation and is already taking effect. And so I'm happy to say that this summer, thanks to my advocacy and really hard work uh, and that of my staff, um, more lead service lines in Illinois will be replaced. Thank you. We're gonna start with you, candidate uh, Stoneback, on this next one. Are you aware of the role nuclear uh, power plants play in Illinois? Do you believe renewable electricity sources could replace nuclear power plants? Do you believe this is an issue in your district? How would you support environmental justice concerns? Would you repeat the question, please? Sure. Are you aware of the role nuclear power plants play in Illinois? Do you believe renewable electricity sources could replace nuclear power plants? Do you believe this is an issue in your district? How would you support environmental justice concerns? Okay, that's three questions, but I'll, I'll do my best to answer in that amount of time. Uh, yes, I am aware of, of, of the role that they play. Uh, they do play a very important role. Um, I think we are transitioning, um, and what I did last year, what we did in the legislature, is pass the uh, CJA, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, which was a really large energy bill that was negotiated with labor unions, environmental groups, all stakeholders, and um, we really wanted to put Illinois on a pathway to 100% clean energy by 2050. Um, we negotiated very hard, and I was pushing for the um, most progressive uh, measures and the earliest um, implementation dates as far as clean energy is concerned. Um, I am a member of the Illinois Green Caucus in the House and uh, a lifelong environmentalist and conservationist. So this is a very important issue for me. Um, of course, we have certain concerns around labor and how we're gonna make this transition. And I was very happy to see all of the equity that was built into CJA. Um, so when we're talking about environmental justice, um, definitely uh, this, this CJA will bring lots of clean energy jobs to our state, create many, many opportunities. It was a, a really successful bill, and I hope you all take the time to learn about uh, CJA and, um, and, and see the effects that it's gonna have in years to come. Thank you, candidate Olikal. Yes, I, I believe Illinois is, at one point was getting almost 30% of its power from nuclear energy, which is a shocking fact for most people around here. And so uh, I think we definitely we can see uh, clean, other clean energy or clean, actual clean energy jobs 
our clean energy sources such as solar and wind can can make up for the difference if we when we transition away from nuclear. Uh, and so I support all efforts like CJA to make sure that we're we're making sure we're sticking to Governor Pritzker's plan to zero carbon emissions. Uh, make sure that we are uh, expanding. Uh, we're any subsidies that are currently going to oil and gas that we're for, we're making sure that we're subsidizing clean energy uh, job creation in Illinois and making sure that the opportunities that come with clean, clean energy job creation uh, go to a lot of the communities that are most affected by uh, the effects of climate change and, and pollution. So uh, those are those are some those would be some of my priorities around the the transition away from nuclear and, and our and our commitment to uh, clean clean and green energy. Thank you, Candidate Olakal, starting with you. Do you think that funding of education is equitable in Illinois? If not, what do you think should be done to make it equitable? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, we are overly reliant on property taxes to pay for our schools. It creates an immense disparity in opportunity. Uh, this district is a perfect example. In one corner of the district, you have schools like Nile, uh, Niles North and Niles West, which are some of the highest funded school districts in the state. And in the other corner of the district, you have kids going to CPS schools that are funded at significantly lower levels. Uh, and this has been, this is a systemic problem because the state's inability to pr fulfill its obligation to fully fund our public schools. And so uh, until we, the state fulfills that obligation, we're gonna continue to see this disparity in education opportunities uh, because of the way that we're paying for schools now. So uh, again, one of my priorities in the legislature will be to make sure that any new funding that comes in, a significant amount of that is allocated to public school funding. Uh, it's gonna be the way, if we don't do that, we'll continue to see d terrible outcomes and uh, we won't, and we'll, we'll, it also leads to more issues related to property taxes and uh, uh, that are driving people out of their communities. And uh, it's just, again, a bad way to pay for schools and does not create equitable outcomes. So I will absolutely support more funding for public schools. Thank you, candidate Stonebeck. I agree, funding in education needs to be far more equitable. And that's why I supported increased funding uh, in the budget for the evidence-based funding formula. Um, we, again, I, I mentioned earlier, put $350 million more last year and this year for a total of $700 million additional dollars into the EBF formula, funding formula. And this funding formula, um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, does help invest more in communities that need it the most. And so the more we pay into the EBF formula, the more we are reaching those communities that most need funding. And so uh, I've been a strong proponent of that, certainly would like to see increased funding. Um, uh, happy with robust increases this year that we were able to achieve, including um, uh, things like uh, $96 million increase for transportation and special education district reimbursements, 54.4 million increase for early childhood education, and that's all the way to 598 million. Um, I also will just briefly mention that I think one of the things that I'd like to see our education system become more equitable is having more diverse workforce, a teacher workforce that really reflects the student body. Uh, I actually went to a legislative retreat last summer that was hosted by the Hunt Institute and we discussed ways where we could incentivize teachers um, to, uh, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Candidate Stonebeck, starting with you. Inflation is an issue of great concern to Illinois residents. Should the state provide tax relief, what would you do to revitalize the economy? Thank you for that question. Inflation certainly is sky high. I think we all are seeing it in the grocery store, at the gas pump. Um, it is disheartening. And while we can't control everything that's going on in the, in the national or global economy, um, I was really happy to help negotiate and push for tax, uh, a tax relief package in the fiscal year 23 budget that included $1.8 billion of various measures of tax relief for homeowners and consumers. Uh, we put a six-month freeze on the gas tax, a one-year freeze on the grocery tax, uh, we strengthened the earned income tax credit system to help uh, working families who need it the most. Uh, my uh, tendency and advocacy is to reward work, not wealth. And certainly in these times of high inflation, that's all the more important. Um, I think that uh, also you'll also see property, a one-time property tax uh, rebate 
If you have the homeowner's exemption of up to $300 per household, that will be rolled out this summer. Hopefully, and we're still working out the process, but that's to ease inflation. We did that specifically to ease inflation. And one-time direct payments to uh, ta appropriate tax filers of $50 per person and $100 if you have a child, um, and that's for people with certain income limits. Uh, to, I believe it's 200,000 uh, income for individuals and 400 for families. Thank you, candidate Olikal. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, with, with inflation, there are so many macroeconomic factors that we can't control. But what the state should be able to control, or similar to what Representative Stoneback shared, uh, short-term tax relief is a, is a good idea to to help those that are going to be they're they're feeling it in their pocketbook. And uh, one thing we need to think about is also the state just has to continue to fill, fulfill its fiduciary responsibility uh, to fill, to pay pensions on time, to make sure the budget is is balanced, and we are generating enough revenue to pay for essential services because unfortunately when when the state is in a position uh, where they can't make their meet their obligations they're cutting services uh, that are essential to a lot of communities and 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 people who are struggling the most who are also going to be the most impacted by inflation so we need to make sure that we're uh, providing the tax relief in the short term but also long term thinking about uh, that making sure that the state's fulfilling its fiduciary responsibilities so that we don't cut services and uh, and find ways to expand them as well Thank you. Starting with you, candidate Olico. College costs, especially tuition, is through the roof. What specifically can you do to help uh, lower costs? And how would you attract good teachers to Illinois? I think uh, specifically to lower costs, uh, we got to think about, you know, oftentimes there might be administrative uh, costs that are bloated, and we need to find ways to cut that out and make sure that funding is going to students and to pay professors so that we're, we're, we're that, that money is focused on education. Uh, I had a conversation with a retired professor from Northeastern University, and she is really scared to see what's going to happen to uh, that school because when we think about college affordability, we often think about the U of I's, the ISU's, but we got to think about these smaller schools like uh, and more local colleges like Northeastern where my parents were able to first get their start when they immigrated here that provide really important services for immigrants, for, for low-income kids, uh, and and, and so the Northeasterns of the world, the Eastern Illinois of the world, the Western Illinois of the world are also very important when it comes to uh, funding our higher education institutions. And so uh, the state has to secure more funding and allocate more of that funding to, to drive down the cost of tuition and keep these schools open. Uh, and so, um, and, and um, again, also deal with some of the administrative costs. And in order to uh, keep people in the profession, we have to make sure that we are it, making sure that professors, especially, are, especially in, in our universities, are being adequately paid. They're taking on immense amount of debt to go to college, and they're often finding jobs that don't pay them well. So I support uh, organizing efforts to protect teacher wages and benefits and incentivize people to stay in the field and uh, support uh, young kids who want to go into the teaching profession, find ways to get those kids scholarships as well to encourage more, pe more young people to go into education. Thank you. Candidate Stoneback. Thank you. That's a very important question. I have spoken with uh, voters in our district who have tens of thousands of, of dollars in, in student loan debt, and it is heartbreaking to hear their stories. Um, we should not be doing this. Uh, we should not be allowing college costs to be skyrocket like this. Um, so I certainly was in favor of, advocated for, and pushed for the increase in MAP funding that we were able to get in this year's budget. We are going to uh, allocate 24, 25,000 additional students a need-based MAP grants. Um, I think this is a critically important step that we've taken. Uh, that's a, a total of 601.5 million in support of MAP funding, a one-year $122 million increase, um, an expansion award of a maximum award of 50% of, of tuition at public universities and coverage. So, uh, so I certainly think this is a, a step in the right direction. Um, certainly, I, I think that there are very good programs, ideas, and uh, incentives that we can offer to teachers uh, to build the workforce and, and certain professions like teachers, nurses, healthcare professionals, um, and, and w that include student loan debt forgiveness. I actually do have a bill that I uh, introduced around this for mental health clinicians um, that would either 
pay for their college costs up to a certain amount or forgive their debt if they go to an Illinois public university. And this is kind of, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Do you think, starting with you, candidate Stonebeck, do you think that access to medical care is equitable in Illinois? What improvements could be made? What have we learned in managing the COVID pandemic that would help us better manage any future pandemics? So uh, two and a half years ago when I was canvassing um, our district and talking to voters, um, I knocked on the door of a physician um, who was working at one of Chicago's uh, hospitals um, on, the, on the south side. And he uh, said, I asked him, you know, as I always do, you know, what, what would you like to see in our state improved? And he said, more equitable health care. Health care in Illinois is definitely not equitable. He recommended a book, which I would also recommend to all of you, called The Death Gap. And it talks about the inequities of our health care system. Um, I purchased the book, read it, uh, was really impacted by it, actually uh, gave one of my colleagues in the legislature a copy of it. Um, and it talked about how uh, in certain areas, really, um, the health care is so bad that there is a decade of difference between someone who, who is living in a certain area, in a more privileged area, than in another area where it, there's a lower income and more disadvantaged um, uh, health care system. And so there's so much to be done. We really need to invest a lot of funding in those specific areas and take specific steps uh, to, to lift up. We did that. We passed actually a safety net hospital funding bill this year. I was very happy to see that passed. And there's much more that needs to be done, but we need to lower the cost of for-profit health care as well in order to get that done and make it more equitable and accessible to everyone. Thank you. Candidate Olico. Uh yeah, healthcare is one of the issues that people across the country are, are rallying behind because they are fed up with the current system. Uh, I support creating a public option in Illinois. Uh, I, for example, am somebody who pays for a health insurance plan uh, several hundred dollars a month for a plan that I essentially can't use through the Obamacare exchange. I would much rather pay into a public system uh, to help subsidize the cost, uh, subsidize Medicaid and expand healthcare through a public option in, in, in that regard. And uh, what COVID showed us is that we don't really have a public health infrastructure. We, don't have, we didn't have contact tracers in place. We, didn't, we weren't prepared for this pandemic because of a failure to invest in public health for decades. So we need to make sure that we're, we're prioritizing that while we're in Springfield when it comes to healthcare dollars. And we also need to hold private insurance companies accountable. The state needs to wield its power against private insurance companies. If only a handful are allowed to operate in Illinois, they need to follow certain rules. Uh, I got a chance to work with a legislator who had passed legislation that forced private insurance companies to cover a very specific type of uh, disease, uh, treatment for that disease. And all of a sudden, these, these uh, parents of these kids that were struggling with this disease were finding bills coming to them and realized that the insurance company had just switched the code. And they found this loophole to avoid this landmark legislation and, and, and regulation. Uh, so we need to make sure that our, the healthcare legislation that is being passed is highly technical and it really does hold them accountable. Thank you. Starting with you, candidate Olicol. Do you think the Safety Act should be repealed? If yes, please give your specific objections to the act. If no, why do you think it represents positive reform? Is that the, could you, could you expand on the Safety Act? I mean, that's your I'm sorry, I, I cannot expand on that. I just want to make sure I'm not. S-A-F-E dash the letter T. <laughs> yes, Bill. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank you. No, I, 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 uh, one thing that I'm very afraid of, there's obviously been a, a conversation about uh, crime and public safety, and my biggest fear is that we roll back all the progress that we've made uh, when it comes to criminal justice reform. Uh, you know, ending cash bail was a very huge milestone for the state of Illinois uh, because what we had was a system that uh, didn't didn't punish people for, or did not take into consideration uh, their, their, when they were held on bond, uh, it, was it was based on inability to pay, not on their actual harm. Uh, and so, so many people have been in, sitting in jail because they can't make bond, uh, and they're taking plea deals because they can't afford to, uh, to, to take days off work, and, and they can't afford representation. So, uh, I support 
uh, criminal justice, uh, I support those, sor those sorts of criminal justice reform efforts. Uh, and if I'm lucky enough to be in Springfield, I wanna make sure that we, uh, when we're dealing with these issues, we're not taking steps back just so that we can say that we did something about crime and not address the real root causes uh, of, uh, of, of crime and of public safety. Uh, so I, I support efforts. I would not repeal or uh, uh, legislation like the Safety Act. Thank you, candidate Stoneback. I think the Safety Act contained incredibly important uh, criminal justice reforms that we had to pass. I was very happy to see that pass. And since then, several times we've passed trailer bills to refine and specify the language. The Safety Act included things like um, putting restrictions on use of deadly force, on chokeholds, on crowd control, um, the duty to intervene and render aid. All of these things are really important to provide protections against, uh, against people who may be detained by police. And after the George Floyd uh, murder, uh, we all wanted to see criminal justice reform in Illinois. Um, so I applaud those efforts. I do not want to see it repealed. I did support the, uh, the clarifications that law enforcement needed to have to understand the implementation of this uh, incredibly important bill. Um, and I think that uh, when it is implemented, uh, we will see that this, this will not cause additional crime or violence. This will actually reduce violence because people will feel better, people will be less victimized and traumatized, um, and uh, it, it's, it's gonna be, it, as, as it's implemented, I think we will see an improvement in criminal justice um, in Illinois. Okay, this is the last question before we move to closing statements, and we will start with you, candidate Stoneback, on this last question. Both of you have sent mailers describing your work against handgun violence. What specifically have you done for common sense gun laws, or would you do for common sense gun laws? So they want specifics. Okay. So um, what specifics do I have? Well, as I mentioned before, following the Sandy Hook school shooting, um, I founded a, a, a nonprofit in Illinois to reduce gun violence through advocacy, awareness, and education. And I led that nonprofit for six years until I stepped down to run for office. Um, together with that, with that group, I helped build a larger Illinois gun violence prevention coalition uh, composed of, at its peak, over 250 member organizations. Um, with that people power behind us, we pushed through five measures, gun safety measures, in the Illinois legislature under Governor Rauner in 2018, and three of them became law, including the Gun Dealer Certification Act, the 72-hour waiting period, and Illinois' red flag law, the Firearms Restraining Order Law. Um, I worked intensively on education efforts um, and uh, helped as um, spearheaded even be far before I was elected, I um, uh, prevented silencers from becoming legal in Illinois. In the legislature, I founded a gun violence prevention caucus to educate my fellow legislators and, and prioritize the gun issue. Uh, last year, I passed a, a major bill to strengthen our firearms restraining order law. I've introduced five pieces of legislation that are now active, including a concealed carry bill that I'm carrying for Cook County of Forest Preserves. Um, I helped get $450 million in public safety funding, and I'm out of time. Thank you. Candidate Olico. Yeah, I think these, uh, it's gonna require comprehensive solutions, and I would support efforts like uh, HP 562. Uh, this is a bill that had universal background checks on all gun sales, uh, person to person. Uh, it had Illinois state fund, it gave money to the Illinois State Police. Uh, this money uh, was to help enforce the laws that exist right now. Um, the Aurora shooting, which took place, was uh, because of a failure of the, the police department to go and uh, take a gun out of the hands of somebody that was deemed unfit to own one. And we can't let people fall through the cracks of the system, and we gotta make sure the funding is there to follow through on the existing gun laws. Uh, and so uh, it's gonna require comprehensive solutions. It's gonna require, uh, you know, we'd also wanna be careful to not uh, over uh, prosecute or over criminalize uh, it, when, we're, when we're going after uh, certain sorts of gun legislation and, and um, we need to make sure that we're doing what we can to also uh, attack uh, illegal gun trafficking. Um, we need to make sure that efforts are there to uh, get these guns off the streets. 
And we need to make sure that we're working with all stakeholders, gun violence prevention groups, community groups uh, who are most affected by gun violence and making sure that they're also part of the conversation uh, at the table when we're uh, implementing and developing the, the, this policy. So um, yeah, it's gonna require comprehensive solutions and, and a lot of collaborative effort. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of the question and answer portion of the forum and we move to closing statements, which as I uh, said at the beginning is in reverse order to the opening statements. So candidate Stonebeck will have a minute and a half to give her closing statement. Yes, I wanna take a minute and uh, talk about a date that many of you will recall. It was November 9th, 2016, and it was the day we woke up and realized that Trump would be our next president. Um, since that day, I knew that I had to set a different path forward. I was already deeply involved in many, many community groups, but I didn't stop there. I marched with women, worked with grassroots groups, and stepped up every chance I found. Elections have consequences, and under Trump, some of our worst fears came true. A hijacked Supreme Court, an insurrection, and lies that were repeated until people believe them. Two years ago, I challenged an appointed incumbent who said he was pro-choice, but when the time came to vote, he turned his back on us. With your support, I won that election. And last year, I was happy to repeal the last anti-abortion law in Illinois. The passage of this bill may never have even happened if my predecessor was still in office. And now, with Roe at stake, it's more important than ever to elect leaders who we know we can trust to protect women's rights. I'm proud of the work that for I've done for our district and state in these tough times. From closing corporate loopholes to crafting life-saving gun safety legislation, I've been honored to serve as your representative, but there's so much more work left to be done. You have my commitment. I will continue to work hard for the district and for our community to protect women's rights, the rights of all of our most vulnerable, and especially to prevent atrocities from happening like what we just saw today. Thank you. Candidate. Um, Olakel, your closing statement. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for putting on this forum and for encouraging people to become civically engaged. This isn't my first time running for office. As some of you may know, I ran for this seat in 2020. After losing that race, I moved on and uh, chose to continue pursuing opportunities that could help bring about change outside of elective office. I had no plans to run again. I was rooting for Representative Stoneback because I knew that her successes were our community successes. However, several community members, organizations, stakeholders repeatedly came to me with their concerns about their representation. They were feeling unheard, forgotten, and left out. And after I saw the incumbent fail to support our state's most historic gun violence prevention bill, HB 562, and learn of her decision to hire someone who was found responsible for the mishandling of over, a chief of staff responsible for a mishandling of over a large incidents of harassment, uh, discrimination, I knew I could not remain on the sidelines. And beyond that, my community, beyond my community, labor unions, elected officials, and advocacy groups felt the same. This is why my campaign has been endorsed by local elected officials like State Senator Ron Villivalum, Alderman Andre Vazquez, D219 School Board President Naima Abraham, Skokie Park District Commissioner Mary Oshana, organizations and labor unions that include the Gun Violence Prevention Pack, the Giffords Pack, Brady Pack, and the National Association of Social Workers, Illinois Nurses Association, Firefighters, Labor's District Council, and more. That's not enough. The most important endorsement I can get is from you, and it's only with your support that we can move, we can effectively move our forward, move our district forward. And I hope to earn your vote. Um, Thank you I very would like much. to clear the record, I'm, if I'm, po if that's possible. I'm sorry, this is the end of. This is the end. I this is the end. We'll be happy to speak to everyone individually at the end of this event to clear the record just, on the blatant misrepresentation. I just ask all of you to show your appreciation for both candidates. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the forum. There is an opportunity to talk to the candidates outside. So thank you. Please remember to vote. Please remember to encourage your friends and neighbors to vote.